Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. As for all who walk by this rule. Now this refers back to the freedom and blessing, the new creation aspect of being in Jesus Christ. Notice here an important aspect. We are to walk by this rule. That is our relation to the things we do uh, and the things we see and the way we interact with all people, places, and things. Uh, and, and, and things. We need to be, I like to say, we need to be informed by this truth. That's the way that we interact with in all ways. Those who walk by this rule, Paul continues, uh, uh, he wishes them peace and mercy. Well, you know, peace and mercy. I, I don't need to explain that. We've already talked about that. Uh, finally, the phrase, and upon the Israel of God. Now, this phrase, to be honest, has caused more dialogue, and in some cases heated dialogue, between scholars than perhaps any that I can think of off the top of my head. The basic problem is that one side sees Israel in this passage as a metaphor for the true ch church universal uh, and cite the overall context of the letter, and they see uh, the church completely replacing Israel. The other side cites the grammatical structure of the verse and contends that this is a blessing on the nation of Israel and that God has not forsaken the Jews. Um, and in, in the extreme cases, they, they argue that the Abrahamic covenant with its genetic aspects of inheritance still apply. Uh, I tend to take a mix of the views that though the Jews may not inherit uh, the Abrahamic covenant, he has not cast them aside totally. Uh, ultimately, there are scholars on both sides of this issue, uh, and this is something where the Bible has to speak to you on this particular clause. And all, uh, you know, you kind of have to go and, and, and decide for yourself where you lie on all this stuff. Chris, yeah, um, just to hit that last part first about the Israel of God. Um, you know, I was we were talking about this before we got you know got started on this, and we were talking about the different angles and it seems like context may, you know, say one thing, but the grammar seems to imply another. Um, but one thing that we both totally agreed on is that it is the one thing that is sure about this verse is that doctrine shouldn't be drawn from this verse. Boy, that's the truth. I mean, it, it's not clear enough in the, the overall context I would submit. Um, okay. So let's go from the beginning and it says, uh, and as many as walk according to this rule, peace beyond them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. And as, and as many as walk according to this rule, and the rule he's speaking of there is this idea of being a new creation. When he said, well, it's neither circumcision or uncircumcision, it's only being a new creation. And so that's the rule he's referring to here. And that's what, uh, you know, this walking in the newness of life that he mentions in Romans. Uh, and, and that's what the rule that Paul essentially blesses here. He says, you know, he's basically giving them a blessing, this peace beyond them and mercy and upon the Israel of God. So there is, as you mentioned, a lot of speculation. Is it is the and upon the Israel of God talking about a different group of believers than those who are walking in the newness of life of, of a new creation? Uh, or is it uh, another way of saying the same thing, basically? And uh, Vincent Word Studies says it this way. The and... Uh, may simply be collective, in which case the Israel of God may be different from as many as walk, etc., and may mean truly converted Jews, or the and may be explicative, in which case the Israel of, Israel of God will define and emphasize as many as, etc., and will mean the whole body of Christians, Jewish and Gentile. In other words, they who, are, they who walk according to this rule form the true Israel of God, the explicative and is, best, is, is at best doubtful here and is rather forced, although clear instances of, instances of it may be found in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 38. It seems better to regard it as simply connective. The, I don't know what that word is, altus, will refer to the individual Christians, Jewish and Gentile, and the Israel of God to the same Christians regarding collectively and forming the new Messianic community. All right, now that everybody's sufficiently bored, yep. let's move on. Uh, what's all that snoring? I can hear you. <laughs> uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 17. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. What Paul is almost certainly referring to here 
are the scars of his persecution. Paul said he was stoned, beaten, jailed, cast into the deep. Uh, this kind of boasting and persecution is one of the things that other people just can't seem to compre comprehend uh, when it comes to Christians. It's just, it's one of those things that it doesn't make sense. Uh, speaking personally, uh, one of the things that really, when I was a young Christian, really impressed me about the apostles, and it was really for me, I think, the most, uh, the the greatest proof of the resurrection was that here were 12 people who were all doubters, uh, self-interested, uh, unlearned. Um, they followed Jesus, and then after the resurrection, they were completely different, uh, carrying this message that was just so intense, uh, with such intensity and such single-minded focus. They went to far-flung corners of the world and died alone, when all they had to do was repent and recant, well, repent, all they had to do was recant their message to save their life. Uh, there are many stories that illustrate uh, this point of for, uh, uh, you know, people not comprehending why people would under, uh, Christians would undergo persecution for the sake of their Lord. Uh, there are many stories that illustrate this point, and one of them, one of which is, is from a sort of a hero of mine, a clergyman from Romania named Richard Wormbrandt. He was, a, he was thrown in solitary confinement for three years at one point because he would not endorse communism and was instrumental in working in the underground church. So they had to do something with him. They threw him in solitary confinement. He said he forgot, his, he forgot all the Bible verses he memorized. He forgot his whole theology. Um, but, um, and there, there are so many, many stories of him, but perhaps the one that most resonates, that most resonates with me for this verse is when he spoke via a taped testimony to the United States Congress uh, in the 50s. And at one point, he takes his shirt off to reveal scar after scar after scar after scar of what happened to him when he was in a communist prison. Um, marks he bore on his body for his faith. Uh, Paul, much like Richard Wormbrandt, bore, uh, they both bore on their bodies the marks of Jesus in this case. This was... Uh, and is a very real appeal. Uh, this was a very clear identification to the branding of a slave as well. Uh, Paul bore the marks of Jesus on his body. He lived it. Uh, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer, another hero of mine, put it, the baptized Christian has ceased to belong to the world and is no longer its slave. He belongs to Christ alone, and his relationship with the world is medi mediated through him. The old man and his sin are judged and condemned, but out of this judgment a new man arises who has died to the world and to sin. Thus this death is not the act of an angry creator finally rejecting his creation and his wrath, but the gracious death which has been won for us by the death of, his, death of Christ, the gracious, gracious assumption of the creature by his creator. It is death in the power and fellowship of the cross of Christ. He who becomes Christ's own possession must submit to his cross, and suffer and die with him. It is a death full of grace. The cross to which we are called is a daily dying in the power of the death which Christ died once and for all. In this way, baptism means sharing in the cross of Christ. Chris? Yeah, man, you also brought up the burying the marks uh, in, ter in terms of almost like the, uh, the bonded slave, you know, yeah. where they, uh, I was just reading the Old Testament again uh, today, where they, where if a if a slave decided that he wanted to be actually a part of the after he was you know let free and he said you know what you guys have been great to me I I want to be here my whole life there was a uh, something that they would do put his ear on the doorpost and essentially pierce his ear and it would be a, a very uh, a good thing for him to have this earring it would be you know a sign that he was uh, a bond slave of the house and that uh, is in, in a lot of ways some commentators take this to mean something of that effect as well. Um, so, so from henceforth, let no man trouble me. So Paul has dealt with quite a lot of issues in this letter to the Galatians, one of which was defending his apostleship, which is pretty early on in the letter. Um, and it, it, it seems that the false teachers incorporated some kind of Paul slander into this deception that they were deceiving people saying, oh, you know, Paul, you know, he's got it kind of right, but you know, he's really whatever, you know, whatever their angle was, they had something to do with Paul because he goes on also in this letter and says, 
things to that effect that, that sort of suggest that there was a Paul element to this false teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, it, that's really not that uncommon today in legalistic circles. Uh, religions like Islam have a very anti-Paul version of Christianity. It's like, oh yes, it was all good, but that Paul, you can't trust that guy. messed it all up, yeah. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of stuff in messianic, sort of hyper-messianic circles today that also have this sort of view. Uh, you can check out a, a three-part, technically two-part, uh, well, technically three-part, but really a two-part podcast series I did called Paulianity Debunked, which uh, deals with a lot of those issues, one particular author. Uh, and uh, actually, so uh, so then we move on to for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus, and I agree with you uh, about all of that. So I'm just going to quote here from Luther. And there's a two paragraph quote here. He says, "The marks of my body indicate whose servant I am. If I was anxious to please men, if I approved of circumcision and good works as factors in our salvation, if I would take delight in our in your flesh as the false apostles do." I would not have these marks on my body. But because I am the servant of Jesus Christ and publicly declare that no person can obtain the salvation of his soul outside of Christ, I must bear the badge of my Lord. These marks were given to me against my will as decorations from the devil and for no other merit but that I made known Jesus Christ. Uh, of the marks of suffering which he bore in his body, the apostle makes frequent mention in his epistles. I think, he says, that God hath set, set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to the angels, and to men. 1 Corinthians 4, nine. Again, unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat, we are made as the filth of the, filth of the world, and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Mike? The offscouring. Yeah, that's great stuff. Uh, verse 18... Galatians chapter 6. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Paul provided a greeting of peace here in verse 16. Now here he ends with an amen in what is called the, in Greek, the vocative mood. This means that in the Greek it carries with it the idea that this amen came from Paul's heart, that he was expressing his feelings. I get the feeling with all the strident language here, Paul is almost carrying through the idea that I've done all I can for you, brothers. Uh, I've laid it out all up for you. Uh, now, the grace, let this grace be with you, and hopefully you will turn. Uh, Paul wants the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ to be with these Galatian brothers. Uh, this is the grace and peace that was a mystery in the Old Testament, but now is revealed in Jesus Christ. Uh, and the incredible, uh, you know, the, the freedom and all of this, all of this stuff. Uh, different points we've all hit on in this study. Um, and he, as I said, he concludes with, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Chris? Yeah, that's a really good insight there. I think that that's, uh, that's exactly what was going on. You know, he was just gone through all this, this whole letter, and really it's up to them now. He makes allusions to that, you know, that he put everything he could into this letter, probably research and you know, prayer and just time and energy and money with the amanuensis and all the, the everything to do and, and all probably in a flurry of like, have you heard what's going on in Galatia? It's crazy, you know, they've they've done all this stuff, so he's probably trying to do it quickly and get all this stuff out there. And, and uh, at some point, you know, this is about as much as he can do beyond praying, which I'm sure that he never stopped praying for these people, mm. uh, even until probably the last morning that he, you know, was beheaded in, in Rome. He probably was playing, praying for Galatia, but that's mm -hmm. of course speculation. So Barclay says of this last uh, verse, and after the storm and stress and intensity of the letter comes the peace of the benediction. Paul has argued and rebuked and cajoled. I don't know. Cajoled. Cajoled. But his last word is grace. For him, the only word that really matters. And that concludes our uh, study of Galatians. Do you want to sort of 
just muse on our thoughts about Galatians in general.